Thank you so much and a pleasant uh, good day to everyone. Thank you for joining us. And uh, indeed, it, it, it has been a very interesting run for uh, Med Synapse as well as PSEDM. This collaboration has really brought about uh, the best in, in many of our lectures. And as we share our lectures with you, we hope that you were able to pick up some important lessons that are applicable in your setting. Thank you for that question. I think that we all need to understand that pregnancy is an interplay of hormones and that understanding how these hormones affect, affect you is really a uh, quite complex process. Uh, there needs to be a balance between all of these hormones and that anything that disrupts this balance puts both the mother as well as the child at risk. Endocrinology is uh, all about achieving balance and that we need to correct the lack of or the excess of hormones that may be present among our patients. Yes, that's a very good question. I think that's very important as well, as we know that uh, in general, thyroid disease may not be as prevalent. We know that the global data tells us that about 2 to 4 percent of pregnant women have thyroid disease. Some of these thyroid diseases may be subclinical or less obvious to a lot of us. And therefore, uh, the implications may not be as clear compared to those overt hyper and hypothyroidism. Uh, a lot of these thyroid disorders occur before pregnancy. And therefore, some patients may have infertility problems that are related to the thyroid. But as you had said earlier, some of them may have their pregnancy and develop the disorders during the period of, uh, of their pregnancy. So that being said, um, the subclinical thyroid disorders are of concern to all of us, and they can also affect the outcome of pregnancy, maybe not as obvious as those with overt disorders on the thyroid, but they can still have an effect on the outcome, uh, whether or not the, the baby is going to be okay or if there's going to be any problem with the baby. Yes, that's uh, again, that's very important that uh, we establish first that for you to get pregnant, you need to have a very good or very stable uh, thyroid uh, environment. And therefore, fertility will always be an issue for those with hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. Now, maternal hypothyroidism has often been closely related to uh, fetal hypothyroidism. And uh, sometimes we refer to them as cretinism. This cretinism can occur in patients uh, having babies that are hypothyroid, and therefore the neurodevelopmental um, progress of these patients is affected in hypothyroid mothers. As you know, if we will try to recall what we know about uh, pregnancies, that the first few weeks, the baby is really dependent on the mother for providing the thyroid hormones, not until the latter part, or at least on the second trimester, when the baby can actually make their own thyroid hormone at about 18 to 20 weeks. And uh, when we talk about maternal hyperthyroidism, the other end of the spectrum tells us that some of our patients with hyperthyroidism or developing hyperthyroidism in pregnancy may have some sort of preterm birth. Some of them will develop hypertension and of course, natal outcomes will be affected. So both ends of the spectrum give us a picture of morbidity for any pregnant women developing thyroid disease uh, during pregnancy or pre-existing thyroid disease. Maternal hypothyroidism can be treated by replacement of uh, thyroid hormones. So often we have um, levothyroxine as the treatment. The usual replacement dose for hypothyroidism is about 1.2 micrograms per kilo per day or even higher for you to achieve the appropriate level of um, maternal TSH. And normally we target anywhere between 2 to 2.5 during pregnancy. But you have to keep in mind that each of the populations all over the world should have their own trimester-specific values. Here in the Philippines, we follow these trimester-specific values. They will give us the uh, actual levels that we will consider as normal or abnormal. 
all over the world, uh, it would be nice to have that. But generally, if you have populations that don't have these trimester specific values, we would like to keep the TSH below 2.5, definitely below 4, which is considered overt high hypothyroidism already. Radiofrequency ablation of thyroid nodules in pregnancy. There's really not much data on this procedure uh, done during pregnancy and there are no recommendations from the various experts all over the world. Uh, often, we may have to wait for the mother to give birth and discuss more invasive procedures once the patient is ready. This is particularly true because uh, during the COVID-19 pan pandemic where we have which we have right now. Uh, most of the procedures that we'll do will probably be moved later on in the hope that this pandemic will probably end. And hopefully by then we can move forward with what we want to do and what the procedures we expect to do for our patients. For thyroid disease in pregnancy, uh, I believe that um, they may be more common than what we know of really. Uh, because we're seeing more patients coming into the clinic, uh, consulting for uh, abnormal thyroid function tests. And therefore, I think that uh, this is true for my country, the Philippines, as well as all other countries uh, all over the world. And perhaps uh, all of us experts should probably need to do more testing because at the moment, the recommendation is really case finding, looking into the question of whether or not the history or the family history or medical history of these patients uh, present with thyroid disease. I think it's high time now that we test our patients if they go into pregnancy. A simple test of TSH will prob probably pick up some of these deranged levels of thyroid hormone. And maybe we can help these patients have better outcomes if we're able to detect them early. Yes, I believe so. Overt hypothyroidism is a lifelong disease. Both the mother and child will be need uh, will will need to be followed, as well as treated appropriately. Pregnancy is a possibility with the right care and follow up. So yes, counseling is going to be very important for our patients. We need to let them know that this is a disease that uh, can be treated, and you can go on with your pregnancy as long as you have proper care. Thank you for that question. Uh, the Philippines, as you know, is a very small country, yet all over the world, you will probably meet a Filipino that you can associate with. In a way, we are practically the same. We have the same problems and uh, the problems that you have may be the same problems that we have as well. What is really important is that we recognize the value of helping each other and sharing what we know. The PSEDM, exist in the service of the Filipino endocrine patients. But as we move forward, PSEDM has now become global. Two things come in mind, two words, engagement as well as uh, connectivity. So as COVID brought us apart by keeping us in our homes, as well as keeping us away from each other, it has also brought us together through the internet, through social media, and we're now able to communicate more effectively because communication is so much easier nowadays. Uh, in a way, we are very happy about this development, at least a silver lining to what's been going on all over the world. Uh, this opportunity to engage everyone all over the world uh, is really something that is a game changer for us. And we would really like to share all the knowledge that we want, uh, we can give you as well as learn from you as well. So I think that it is a two-way uh, process. Uh, you learn from us, we can also learn from you. And that's really the essence of a global community, uh, a global medical community that really helps each other during these difficult times. Thank you for that question. Understanding the dynamics of hormones during pregnancy may be daunting for a lot of our patients, for doctors, it may be a little bit complex, but really, you can still understand it. Uh, good clinical practice results from sound clinical judgments and based on evidence-based studies. Uh, sharing this knowledge is vital and therefore, opportunities of engagement such as this is very important. We learn from each other. 
So let me talk about MedSynapse. I'm very happy to be able to engage all of you in MedSynapse. I've had the opportunity to meet all of the team or most of you in the team. They're all very hardworking. I think that the success of PSEDM Hope Convention as well as all the activities of PSEDM would not have been possible in the international sense if we did not partner with MedSynapse. You've done an excellent job. I think everything uh, is, is really an opportunity for us to share uh, the knowledge that we have as well as the resources that MedSynapse and this partnership is something that we really cherish. I think a lot of people will get to appreciate that a platform such as yours is bringing the data and content to a lot of the people that really need it. This is an opportunity again to share knowledge all over the world, not only from our country, but we can learn from other countries as well. The platform of MedSynapse is truly global. We've seen engagements from all over the world, from MENA, also from the Middle East. These are areas that we have not engaged. Of course, we're well known in the Asian region as well as the ASEAN region, but the global scope of MedSynapse has brought us into areas that we have not engaged. So once again, I think that we are very, very uh, lucky to have this partnership with MedSynapse, an excellent platform for you to get engaged with.